program tonight, as you know, is, is very special. Uh, the title of it that we sent out in our materials was dealing with, uh, with Russia. Uh, under that title, uh, I'm fascinated to uh, look forward to uh, what the ambassador uh, has to say. Jack Matlock um, has been a wonderful public servant, uh, 35 years in the Department of State. I was interested that uh, in his book, which uh, uh, Autopsy of a, an Empire, he noted that uh, he was looking forward as a graduate student to either teaching or going into the Foreign Service. Uh, he's had the enormous uh, good fortune of 35 years in the Foreign Service and now, of course, is uh, a professor at, at Princeton, although his time at Princeton is essentially uh, research and, and writing. Ambassador Matlock uh, graduated from Duke University, summa cum laude. He holds a master's degree and a certificate of the Russian Institute at, from Columbia University. He entered the Foreign Service in 1956. He's been, of course, a Russian expert. I should note uh, he also taught uh, uh, Russian. Uh, I believe both Russian, uh, Russian language at Dartmouth College for several, several years prior to going into the Foreign Service. And incidentally, he also had a year sabbatical from the State Department at Vanderbilt University. But in any case, his major expertise has been uh, in Russia. Uh, he and Mrs. Matlock lived there for 11 years during three as assignments prior to becoming ambassador there, four total. He served uh, First, in 1961 to 1963 as a vice consul and third secretary in Moscow. He was then minister counselor and deputy chief of mission 1974 to 1978 and charged the affairs ad interim in 1981. He served as ambassador to Czechoslovakia, 81 to 83, and then uh, was at the National Security Council as special assistant uh, with responsibilities for, Easter, for European and Soviet affairs until 1986 when President Reagan selected him to be our ambassador to the Soviet Union. President Bush asked him to remain on and he served in that position until the summer of 1991 and thus was our last ambassador to the Soviet Union. He served during those five absolutely extraordinary years of uh, of enormous historical change. Uh, his book, which he has written about the, that period of time, is quite appropriately entitled Autopsy of an Empire, in which he an analyzes the reason for the collapse and death of that, that system. It's a wonderful book, which uh, is commended to all of you. I should note also that uh, Mr. And, uh, Ambassador and Mrs. Uh, Matlock were uh, in Africa for seven years three assignments there, uh, which is not unrelated to their uh, experience in the Soviet Union, in that, uh, on one level, uh, Africa was going through a period of decolonization and creating new regimes, which is the same historical experience, new regime creation, which the 15 former republics are going through. And it also was a time when Soviet influence in Africa was of interest to, to the United States. We're fortunate tonight, of course, to have one of the nation's leading authorities on the former Soviet Union and Russia today. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the nation has been fortunate not only because of Ambassador Matlock's service, but by the fact that uh, his, his book itself is, uh, is unique in having the person who was on the spot on the inside of American foreign policy uh, sharing his thoughts and, and impressions uh, with the entire intellectual and policy-making community of the nation. Uh, I know that uh, all of you uh, look forward to his remarks with as much enthusiasm as I do. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Ambassador and now Professor Jack Matlock. <laughs> Thank you very much for those kind words. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you this evening.
I think that the turnout certainly contradicts the conventional wisdom that interest in Russia and that area of the world is declining in the United States. I think you're, you're proving the, the opposite. And, um, and I do uh, appreciate your interest because I think the subject is important. I must say, uh, and I was reminded of this when your next program was mentioned, that in my many years in Moscow, I learned that of all the American correspondents who were stationed there, invariably the Baltimore Sun would have one of the best. Wise, excellent reporting, and I think Baltimore is very fortunate in that sense. You're certainly getting excellent coverage, uh, even if you don't read some of the other papers, which you probably do. Uh, but uh, certainly that was very noticeable to those of us who work closely with the American Press Corps in Moscow. Well, how does one deal with a country which is going through the sort of turmoil that clearly Russia is going through? That's the theme I wanted to address tonight. And I don't have to point out to you the sort of conflicting reports we get about what is going on there. Because when you think about dealing with a country, or for that matter, an individual or a company, the first thing you have to ask is, well, what sort of country is it? Uh, what sort of person is it? What sort of company is it? And the news from Russia contains many, many elements, some of them conflicting with others. And it's very difficult to sort it out. They've been having elections now almost every year, either for parliament or for president now twice, uh, for the last five or six years. A very new thing for Russia. Uh, yeah, and even though there have been reports of irregularities, we find in the latest presidential election that the Russian people came out in enormous numbers, much more than our people came out, and for the second time elected a president who received a majority of the votes. We have a president for the second time who wasn't able to manage a majority of the votes. Yeah, that looks pretty good for democracy, doesn't it? Well, there are problems. Inflation is down. In 92 and 93, it was running in double digits per month. As a matter of fact, the annual inflation in 92 was something between one and a half and 2,000. It uh, when you get into figures like that, uh, it's awfully hard to be precise. It wiped out savings, and it created enormous problems. Inflation is down. It's almost controllable for the last few months, and yet there is a fiscal crisis because the government isn't collecting taxes. And this means that a lot of people, both in the public and private sectors, sometimes for two, three months running, don't get paid. Contradictions. They have pressure groups. Many groups in society have special interests, and now that politics are open, the press is open, they express these interests. Some people seem surprised by that. I wonder why, but they are, and it's very noticeable. There's crime. Crime is very widespread. And unless you put it in perspective, that's one of the most, I would say, negative aspects. It's a negative aspects aspect, to be sure. And yet, in a certain sense, the country has been ruled by criminals for a long time, because the Communist Party operated essentially on a criminal basis and an illegal ex or extra-legal basis. And many of the same people continue to operate on that basis, though they may have switched hats and are now capitalists. Health is deteriorating. It was not good before. In fact, the life expectancy was declining steadily in the last 20 years in the Soviet Union. But in the last couple of years, male life expectancy has fallen to 57 years. Can you imagine that? Female life expectancy is a little more, 
but even it is in the 60s, far lower than other advanced industrial countries. And this is an advanced industrial country. It's not a, a third world country. It's not a largely rural country now. It's urban. It's industrialized. The environmental problems are absolutely enormous and in many cases are getting worse because it takes money to clean them up. And right now, the government doesn't have the money and the money in private hands seems to go out of the country more than inside. And on top of all of this, we hear very often about the chauvinistic rhetoric sounding like threats to others. There's not much action behind it, but the rhetoric is there. And given Russia's history and the Soviet history, this is bound to be uh, disconcerting, to say the least. So all of these indications and all of these facts are going on and many more. Give us a picture of turmoil and give us a picture which is far from certain if we want to start making predictions or to characterize the society and what's going on in a general sense. Um, it's very puzzling, particularly to those who assume that policy is made on a rational basis because so much seems to be irrational. To those who make that assumption, I, I often say, well, why do you make that assumption? Is policy made on a rational basis anywhere? Nowhere that I know of. It's sort of like these, these uh, schemes that uh, economists love to come up with that supposedly we're always tending toward some kind of equilibrium of stability, except the equilibrium remains some sort of abstract concept uh, without very much re uh, uh, relation to reality. Nevertheless, however one defines what we're looking for, it is confusing. And it is true that Russia is quite capable, as most societies, of carrying out at least temporarily irrational policies. And maybe they're a little more capable of it than some of the rest of us. I'm reminded of a story that uh, presidential candidate, unsuccessful presidential candidate, Grigory Yavlinsky told on his last trip uh, to Washington, which was uh, about six weeks ago. Uh, he has the reputation of one of the most westernized of the candidates for president. He got only 7% of the vote, uh, but he is a brilliant economist. And in many ways, his prescriptions for economic reform, to many of us, seem the most rational. But he told the story that I think tells us at least a good bit about the mood in Russia. And the story was of uh, two hunters who loved to go big game hunting, and they would fly off into the wilds in a small plane. And they would hire the plane, and the pilot told them as they were going off to hunt, they were going to be there for a week, he said, look, this is a small plane. I know you're, you're looking for bear and reindeer and, and, and big game, but we've only got room for one. So only shoot one, because I can't bring back two. Well, he leaves them there. He comes back a week later, and they have two bears. And he said, look, I told you guys, only one. And they said, look, come on, you can get it in the plane. You know, the last time you took us hunting, we also had two. And we paid you an extra $100, and you found room. Now, now here's 200 so the pilot finally huffs, puffs, stuffs the both bears in. They take off. 20 minutes later, they have to make a crash landing. And they're shaken up, not too wounded, but they don't know where they are. And one of them asks the other, where are we? And he says, gee, I, you know, I really don't know, but I think it's not far from where we crashed last time. So I would say Russians themselves are not overly confident about the rationality of the decisions they made. Well, let me organize my thoughts to the degree they can be organized into three questions this evening. One is, what is really going on in Russia with all these contradictions? Second, does it matter anymore? Because some people say, look, Russia is so weak uh, they're so disorganized, we can forget them. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people seem to be acting on that. We find, for example, uh, 
Now, study of Russian in our colleges and high schools is not much over half what it was at the height of the Cold War. We don't need to ponder things like that. Does it matter? And then the third question is, how do we deal with it? Which is really the subject that I came tonight to talk about, but I don't think we can talk about it until we think about the first two. Obviously, if we ask what is going on in Russia, we have to say, first of all, there's no simple answer. And as I've pointed out, many of the trends seem quite contradictory. And this makes predictions particularly hazardous. Back when I was a, an ambassador and had to watch what I said, if I wanted to keep my job, uh, people would often ask me what I think was going to happen. And my usual answer was, gee, I, I haven't a clue. Of course, as soon as it happens, I'll be happy to explain why it was inevitable. <laughs> and, you know, it is true that once something has happened, it, you can look back and usually say, aha, you know, when X or Y happened five years ago or ten years ago, that made it inevitable. It probably didn't, in fact. Uh, but in, uh, it's certainly easier to look at causes when something important has happened, when there has been a watershed. Now, it does seem to me, with all of the hazards of prediction, that the presidential election this year in Russia will probably turn out to be an important turning point in Russian political history. Uh, until then, many people doubted that the election would be held at all. They said, look, Russians are turned off on elections, number one. Number two, Yeltsin can't win. Number three, the people around him are afraid that if they lose their jobs, that they'll end up in jail, considering the way they have conducted their jobs. Therefore, they won't let him lose. They'll cancel the elections first. After all, this is a country which has very little history of real elections. Yeltsin himself was elected president only in 1991. And he dissolved one parliament, and we've had some parliamentary elections, but you can't tell me that he and the people around him are going to really subject him to an election as unpopular, unpopular as he is. And he was running about 4% popularity in January of this year. Well, the election was held. And Yeltsin won. It took two rounds to win. And yet he won by a fairly comfortable majority. And though there certainly were some irregularities, to put it mildly, with campaign financing. I, for one, am convinced that the Russian people knew what they were doing, and it was a free decision. Because the opponents, though they were not treated as well in the media as he was, had access to it. People knew what they stood for. But ultimately, most Russians voted for Yeltsin, not because they liked him, or not because he was popular anymore, but simply because the alternative was a communist, or called himself a communist, and though he claimed he knew he couldn't go back to the past, people weren't sure, if they elected him, if they would ever have a chance to vote for anybody else. The theory being, if he calls himself a communist, how can he be a Democrat? And how can we trust him to leave office when the time comes. They knew that Yeltsin's health was not the best. Uh, they knew that there were a lot of things they didn't like about the way he had ruled. But one thing they could be sure of, if they elected him, there would be more elections. And I think that was a very crucial factor. Um, now, of course, democracy as we understand it is not just elections, and we should never be fooled into thinking that it is. But you can't have democracy without them. It's one of these ironies that uh, you can elect people and end up with a tyranny if you don't have some of the other things. And yet there's no way you can have anything calling an election, if uh, calling democracy, you call democracy or qualifies for it, unless you have periodic elections. And I think that now every would-be president and every would-be governor, for that matter, in Russia understands if they're at all serious, that if they ever get power, there's only one way to do it. That's by getting elected. Now that's new, and it's significant. On the other hand, Russia has been very slow 
in developing some of the institutions you need to make democracy work in the full sense. They don't have many of the institutions, in including some of the crucial ones. One of the most important, of course, is an independent judiciary and an administrative structure with the basis of laws so that you can ensure property rights and ensure the enforcement of contracts. This is very important for a market system of the economy. And I think a market system in the economy and democracy are very closely connected. The right to property, and uh, I think, is absolutely essential uh, if you are to have a full-fledged democracy. And yet, for an operating market system, the rule of law, independent judiciary, relatively uncorrupted bureaucrats with limited powers are all extremely important. And these are things that Russia has not yet been able to create. On the other hand, some of the things a democracy needs are they've made great progress in a surprisingly short period of time in a country that never in its history until about 1990 had anything resembling a free press. You have a press that some would say is even too free, uh, since it is so full of sensationalism and irresponsible statements. But of course, the definition of freedom is the freedom, or freedom of speech, is the freedom also to make irresponsible statements, because one person's irresponsible statement is another person's responsible statement. And uh, certainly, when you look at the Russian media today, you can find any sort of an opinion a wa complete range, no matter how crazy. Uh, and I think that's progress. A second thing that has happened, and this I think is also very profound, is that Russia is a country which for centuries has been ruled from one center, either Moscow or St. Petersburg, wherever the capital was. They moved the capital a couple of times from Moscow to St. Petersburg in Peter the Great's time and then back to Moscow in Lenin's time but there was, wherever it was, there was one thing that was true, and that was that everything was controlled from Moscow to the degree it could be controlled, or from St. Petersburg, that is, from the capital. It was ruled from a center. And though in the Soviet period they talked of the country as being in form a federation, it wasn't really, because the Communist Party was highly centralized, and the Communist Party manipulated and ran uh, the entire governmental machinery. What has happened since 1991 is that much of the power, indeed most of the power, has slipped out of Moscow's hands, partly by design, because they did adopt a federal constitution, but more importantly, simply because Moscow increasingly could not exert the sort of control over the country that uh, it had in the past. Decrees emanating from Moscow, even laws emanating from Moscow, are sometimes abided by, but more often are ignored if they're inconvenient to local officials. It's becoming more and more important to most people what the local and provincial officials, the equivalent of our states, feel and do than what Moscow does. And this has its ugly aspects, because there is corruption involved in this, and there is also crime involved in this uh, process. And yet, at the same time, I think ultimately it is a healthy process. A country the size of Russia, and wi particularly with its variety of people, its variety of climates, it covers 11 time zones. Think about that. Uh, it seems to me cannot be simply ruled from one center. You've got to give the people a feeling of empowerment, to use a, vogue, a word in vogue, and people have to feel that they have some influence over what happens in their lives, if you're ever going to have anything like democracy. And this is something people haven't had before. They're having to learn painfully. But I think they're learning. Gorbachev used to say in private, I never heard him say it in public, but he would say in private in the late 80s that, you know, my task is to turn Russian history upside down. This is a country which has always been ruled from a center. 
And that means that our people don't know how to make decisions. But in the modern world, I can see that that doesn't work. It's not only the advanced West that is leaving us in the dust. It's not only Japan that's leaving us in the dust. But if we keep on this way, we can't even keep up with South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore. And he was right. He thought that you had to pass the power down, and yet he realized that people weren't prepared to accept it at that point. So he said, you know, our people have never made decisions for themselves. They don't know how to do it. And it's served, therefore, it's going to take time. I think he was profoundly right, and although he personally didn't succeed in bringing about this very fundamental revolution in people's thinking, I think the deterioration from the center has, in effect, forced people to take their lives in their own hands and to show that they were resourceful. And this has certainly been true when we begin to look at the economy. Now, just like elections don't solve anything automatically, though they're essential for democracy, I believe a market economy doesn't solve anything automatically either. It's just that no other basis for an economy works. Uh, you need more than just a market economy, but in my opinion, without the market economy, there's nothing else that you can, uh, uh, can really do rationally because there is no measure of what things really cost. In the old Soviet Union, every price was set arbitrarily and without any real regard for the cost of production or for that matter for demand other than the bureaucrats' concept of what was desirable. Uh, and this led to enormous distortions of production, things being produced that nobody wanted, an excess of armaments and things which perhaps provided employment, uh, but certainly didn't give people anything to eat or better clothes or better medical care, and sopped up much of their high-tech expertise which was developed. And there was no way in the Soviet system really ultimately to say what this was costing society. You know, that's one of the troubles the CIA had, and they're often accused of underestimating the burden on the economy. It was something you couldn't quantify. We couldn't and they couldn't. Because even if you translate everything into our prices, uh, that doesn't work because the quality isn't the same. The specs are not the same. And uh, yes, the CIA usually came up with estimates uh, that the military was a burden something like 15 to 17 percent. Turns out it was probably 25 percent of the GOP or more on an economy that was much smaller than ours. This was an enormous strain. And yet there was no way to measure it. There was no way to measure the real utility. And there's a story which I think is not apocryphal, that when Gorbachev first came to Washington in 1987, at the state dinner, he was seated at, uh, was seated at his table, uh, Professor Pipes of Harvard. And uh, Professor Pipes asked him directly, he said, Mr. Chairman, tell me, what is your defense budget? And Gorbachev said, Professor Pipes, I don't have a clue. But as soon as I find out, and I'm trying to, I'll make sure you and others know too. I think he was telling the truth in a real sense. Well, so the decision was made to move toward a market economy. And in Gorbachev's time, they tried to do it gradually. But there was no way to do it gradually. Because the whole Soviet system was built to make a market economy impossible. So you couldn't graft. 20% of a market economy on 80% of a straight controlled economy and have any but one result. That is, the state controlled economy rejects that organ transplant just as your body would reject a chan transplant from, say, a chicken. Uh, it just, uh, there was no way that you could convert that economy quickly. One of our wisest economists who worked for the White House for a time, Ed Hewitt, who 
who died prematurely a few years ago, still at the height of his intellectual powers, said at one point in the late 80s, what Gorbachev is trying to do may be impossible because he's redesigning an aircraft and is trying to keep it flying while they change the wings. And he said, you know, I, I don't believe it's going to stay up. And indeed it didn't. The crash has been pretty complete and for some people, for most people, a very painful. All right. Nevertheless, it seems to me there has been great progress, even though the impediments that we hear about and read about every day are certainly there. The big change is there is no central planning. People are on their own. But in any w many areas, it's difficult to call the system truly a market system because the markets tend to be rigged in many cases uh, or monopolized. And there's not been enough of breaking up monopolies. And those pressure groups that I mentioned operate politically, often represent the special interests and even monopoly groups whose main interest is to keep their privileged position and not to bring in competition that's going to make them more efficient. So you've got a contrast, often, between what the country needs and what special interest groups with great power and now a lot of money have in a democratic system to influence policy, uh, which is not in their immediate interest. Privatization has occurred very extensively. Up to nearly two-thirds of the state enterprises have been partially or fully privatized, according to statistics. And yet, one has to say it was a qualified success. Because in many cases, it was simply a matter of the old managers contriving, and often by quasi-legal or even illegal means, of retaining control. Except now they own, they control the ownership rather than simply the management rights, which were not rights before, under the old system. This has uh, led to a very strong feeling among the populace that privatization was bad. I think the planners of privatization, notably Mr. Chubais, who currently is chief of staff to the president, before was the first deputy prime minister for privatization, calculated that if he took on all the managers, it would never get done. That the only way to do it was to do it quickly, and okay, if the current managers rip off the state and take control, you have to allow that to happen, to have it happen at all, but then you force them to operate in a market. In other words, they either learn to swim in a market economy or you force them into bankruptcy. And if they go into bankruptcy, then the ownership will pass once again, perhaps to people better able to manage it in a market economy. I'm now speculating on what the logic was. I don't think it was set out that way. I wouldn't have expected it to be, but I think that was the logic behind it. And where we are, if that is the case, is in right the threshold of the stage where you try to make the market work by forcing the various owners now uh, of uh, these properties to operate in a market manner. And if they can't do it, if they can't make a profit, they can't pay their taxes, force them into bankruptcy. Uh, so that you uh, will continue uh, the process of reforms. Whether that can in fact be done is one of the big questions before uh, uh, Russian policymakers and uh, the Russian government today. Now, um, what has happened in all of this? Well, the statistics show that production is way down, and, not, but, and also government revenues are down. Revenues are down because most people don't pay taxes. The tax rates are so high that in many cases an entrepreneur would have to pay about 105% of cash flow if he or she paid them all. So in a situation like that, and particularly since they don't get any government services, typically nobody pays any. Uh, I don't think you can explain everything by the Laffer curve, but I'll tell you at its extremes, it seems to be true. If tax is zero, 
you get zero returns. If tax is 100%, you get zero returns. Uh, and obviously, they've placed themselves somewhere on the wrong side of the Laffer curve in this case. Uh, and yet, the political problems of getting the tax code right, even though I, you can't talk to a Russian official who doesn't agree with you, yes, we got to get this changed. But how to get it changed when there are so many people in the economy now who actually are benefit from either special exemptions or the fact that they're making money and over fist and not being held accountable for, for any taxes. Uh, they tend to buy representatives to contribute heavily to political campaigns and so on. So, you know, it's one thing to say Russia ought to be a democracy, but at times, particularly if you need to do things that are very hard on people with a lot of money and power, you find that sometimes you wish uh, uh, that maybe there wasn't so much democracy. In any event, uh, this remains a question mark how quickly some of these problems can be worked on. Nevertheless, it does seem to me that the basis for further progress is there because the country is a country with many well-trained people, people uh, well-trained technically at least, uh, not necessarily in Western management styles, and there are not enough people who know anything about uh, accounting that means something, or for that matter, about business ethics. Uh, but uh, obviously, these are things that it takes time uh, to master. The natural and human resources are very rich. The possibilities are very great. And yet, if we go from the politics to the economy, and look at the state of morale, what you might say the spirit of the nation, we also see some very, very serious problems. In a sense, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was brought on, I would remind people, primarily by the action of Russia's elected leaders, you would have a Soviet Union, a truncated one of some sort, if Russia had desired it in December 1991. Without the Baltic states, certainly. Without the Transcaucasus, certainly. Without Ukraine. But most of the rest would have stayed. Central Asia, Belarus. It was Russia in the final analysis that decided it didn't want the empire or what was left of it because it was too much of a drain. Now, yet this left Russia without a traditional sense of identity. After all, throughout its history, Russia had either been an empire headed by a czar or had been part of and saw itself as leader of a Soviet Union, a communist empire. Now it was suddenly something much smaller, although still quite big, with only half the population of the Soviet Union. And people were torn. Many would say, this is a catastrophe. We've lost half our people. How can we be self-respecting Russians when our whole country has been fragmented. And others might say, look, this is crazy. These non-Russian republics were never truly part of Russia. They didn't want to be. We're healthier without them. Now we can finally be ourselves because we too were a colony, a colony of a communist empire, an ideological empire. That wasn't a Russian empire. And that Russian culture suffered as much as Ukrainian or Baltic or Central Asian. And there's something to that argument. But the thing about this is that it's not just a matter of argument between groups that hold these views. These different emotions tend to coexist in individuals. People themselves, many, have not really decided what the country is really about, what its future ought to be, and what it means to be a Russian. There's one saying that one hears that I think is rather profound. It said that anyone who does not regret the collapse of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anyone who wants to revive it has no brain. <laughs> and I think that is felt very much, but it still leaves open the question, OK, what is Russia? Now, in this sort of attitude, when many, many people feel that their lives have taken a nosedive, Pensioners who 
whose pensions hardly cover enough to buy food, and even so, sometimes it isn't paid for two or three months on end. Other workers in defense industries who have nothing to produce anymore and are not getting paid. You know, it's easy to say for a demagogue to come and say the problem is the Soviet Union was destroyed. Things were better then. Things were more stable. The West did us in, the United States in particular. They want to keep us weak. There are plenty of grounds for demagoguery there, and the demagogues have been out in numbers. And yet, when you look at the broader picture, I think it is clear that Russia no longer has the strength to reassemble an empire by force. And if it is rational, it won't try. On this point, most people are rational because they're not voting for the demagogues, at least not in large numbers. Only those that have a populist part of their campaign who talk about improving wages, improving pensions, that sort of thing, they'll get votes. And yet those who are simply, you might say, the empire builders, if that's all that's in their campaign, they're not winning elections. Now, politics, as I said, is not always rational, least of all in Russia. But it seems to me that if there should be any attempt to play an imperial role, it's going to fail, and fail very quickly. So we have a Russia in turmoil, in fact, and yet one that has put a lot of very burdensome history behind it. Now, let me turn to my second question. I'm going to have to treat this a lot faster because I want to have some time for questions. Does it matter? Does it matter to us? Just a couple of weeks ago, I heard a very prominent person at one of our roundtable meetings who was a specialist on China and the Far East, who made the statement that Russia will gradually sink into inconsequentiality. We can ignore it. I don't agree with that, and I don't understand how a person who really looks at uh, the world with clear eyes could make such a statement. I suppose you get mesmerized by the country that you're closest to or most interested in, and certainly I recognize that China is undoubtedly going to be a greater and greater problem for U.S. foreign policy, given its growth rates, given the dynamics of what is going on there. But is Russia inconsequential? Well, first of all, <laughs> there are over 20,000 nuclear warheads still there, not aimed at us anymore. And if they, Russia has a rational leadership, they won't be. But if they should escape, or even a small fraction of them, to irresponsible hands, it's a nightmare. And not only nuclear weapons, 50,000 tons of chemical weapons, bacteriological weapons in quantities which we've never been able to determine, and maybe even their civilian leaders don't know. The so-called poor man's ultimate terrorist weapon, if they get out, or take a role in regional disputes. Does anybody really think that peace can be created in the Middle East? That the talks between the PLO and Israel, or between Israel and Syria, can be successful in the long run if the Russians decide they don't want it? True, they haven't been active there recently, but they haven't tried to block it. And they certainly have contacts and so on. They could. Or let's look at China. Yes, China is growing fast. Yes, China could become more of a military threat. In that case, isn't there a, uh, something to be said for at least desiring that Russia would stay strong enough to provide at least some balance? After all, they have the longest land border with China and probably the most to lose if China gets aggressive. There are many reasons that I think we simply cannot and must not ignore Russia. Now, some people would say, you know, I don't fear or even expect Russian aggression toward advanced countries, toward NATO countries, toward our allies. The problem is their behavior toward those republics that were once in the Soviet Union. And that, I think, is true. If there is going to be a problem with Russia's behavior toward other countries, it will be 
those in its immediate neighborhood because partly of the imperial heritage of many people's thinking and also because so much of their lives were connected before and still are. 20 million ethnic Russians live now outside the borders of Russia, often right along the borders. Uh, the economies were designed by the communist rulers so that they could not be easily separated. And uh, all of them suffer uh, when trade is cut off or when barriers go up. So obviously Russia has a great interest in what happens in its immediate neighborhood. And I would just say that sometimes people see their expressions of that interest as crossing the line between sensitivity to what happens in the neighborhood and an effort to push their weight around in essentially in imperial ways. I don't have time to discuss it in detail, but I would say that in my opinion, there is no grand design to reassemble the empire by force. I think the Russian government does want a certain reintegration, particularly economic, of many of the areas that were once in the Soviet Union, and if it's done voluntarily and to the mutual benefit of all the parties, it seems to me there's nothing to object to in that. But I also think that when it comes to security issues, we should recognize that countries, particularly large countries, tend uh, to be rather sensitive about what happens in their neighborhood. We've been pretty upset at times uh, when there were too many Soviet troops in Cuba. We got pretty upset over things that happened in Dominican Republic or Haiti, Panama, Nicaragua. We didn't consider ourselves imperialists if we tried to do what we would consider to protect our interests, and sometimes we intervened pretty violently and pretty directly. Seems to me that uh, to say that every time Russia reacts in a similar fashion, they're simply being an imperialist is perhaps putting it wrong. Maybe we ought to relax a bit. If it's their neighborhood, they're going to have certain sensitivities. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're out to conquer the world if at times they react to what they see as potential threats. So how to deal with this? What can the US do? First of all, I think that we must recognize wh uh, what is profoundly true if we put aside all of the perturbations of these various uh, to's and fro's and ins and out that we read about every day in the paper. And that is that fundamentally Russian and American interests are not in conflict. It's hard to realize that because we are so conditioned by the Cold War. But the Cold War was not about Russia's interests. The Cold War was about communism. And communism is dead there. It is dead as a system. There are remnants of it that, just like bacteria or a virus in the system, that still plague it. And yet, it is no longer a system in control. Basically, our interests, if you say the, list the top eight or ten American interests, they're totally consistent with Russian interests. Keep these weapons of mass destruction under control. Reduce them as fast as possible. If they get out, they're just going to threaten Russia even before they threaten us. That's a mutual interest. Bring peace to some of these areas. We have a mutual interest in peace in Bosnia. We haven't seen eye to eye as to how to get there or what we ought to do, but neither of us want bases or are trying to control it or make it a colony. Basically, we'd like to see some peace and stability. And I could go on and on and on, and you'll find that the things we've argued about either tend to be secondary or tend to be the case of one side or the other, not really clearly defining what its real interests are. And the second point is, we need to recognize that Russia's security and feeling of security is important if we're going to have security in the world and stability. If we assume that Russia is going to be a threat and we act accordingly, that's going to tend to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because you leave it nowhere to go. But if, on the other hand, we make the assumption that if Europe is to have real security, Russia has to be part of that system that creates it, then I think you begin to encourage 
more responsible behavior and encourage uh, the development of democracy. General Lebed, who provided Yeltsin with the critical margin of votes to win the election, uh, he got 15% on the first round, then threw his weight to, uh, to Yeltsin, was in the States a week before last. And as he said at one point there, Europe cannot be secure unless Russia is secure. And therefore, Russia needs to be part of any European security system. Lebed is one, by the way, who is not too worried by NATO expansion. And he has said publicly, look, it's going to weaken NATO more than increase its power. And besides, NATO is a defensive alliance. But he is concerned with the message, the message that Russia is not part of the European security system. And uh, he told me in a private meeting I had with him, he said, look, you know, give NATO a few more tasks, change the name slightly, because the name for 40 years we've been told it's an aggressive alliance. It gives us political problems. So even the most, I would say, some of the most uh, rational of the Russian leaders on the issue have to deal with a political problem. And I'm not sure that the way we're handling that issue is in the best interests of everyone concerned. Second, uh, I think that we do need to avoid, uh, just as a doctor should, I oath, avoid doing harm. We can't determine what happens in Russia, but sometimes our policies can bring out the worst in them rather than encouraging the best. Now, that doesn't mean you approve everything they do or you coddle them necessarily. Certainly, when their demagogues or even people in their government make a statement which is unacceptable, we need to make it clear that it's unacceptable and why. In most cases, it's un not only unacceptable to us, but damaging to them. And you need to approach it from the standpoint of their own interests. And I think if one does that, you will find that most of the things that are in their interest are also quite consistent with ours. But that does mean we have to stop assuming that Russia is an enemy and has to start thinking of ways actively that we can, can in practice, make our interests consistent with theirs. That would allow us to build habits of cooperation and in building these habits of cooperation, uh, we encourage precisely the type of healthy developments that we want to see and which are so important for all of us. When it comes to investment and economic relations. I feel very strongly Russia needs investment, but is going to have to create the conditions that make this possible. The first sign uh, that the country is really open for widespread foreign investment will be when Russians themselves begin to invest in their own country. I think there are real opportunities there, but I do think that you still have to recognize that the, the whole operation of commercial law and protection of rights and arbitration of disputes on the part of the government is still very rudimentary and probably inadequate. So one has to be extremely careful at this time. Still, it is so much in the interests of the Russians themselves to straighten this out. I'm sure it's going to be. It's going to take some time, and there are going to be mistakes along the way. But I think they are on the right way. And I think that if we recognize that and operate on that basis, we'll find that even with all the irrationalities we see, they're not that hard to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for a spectacular, I think, overview and, uh, and insights. Uh, the ambassador will answer questions now until 10 minutes after 7. Yes, the question is, uh, regards recent strikes because people aren't being paid their salaries. And he's wondering how they are living if they're not being paid a salary. Uh, there is no adequate welfare system, first of all, and this is one of the problems. Uh, there uh, in their economic reforms, I'm afraid they put the social safety net last. And uh, not being able to collect taxes has 
put a great strain on uh, the government's ability so that um, uh, this is a very, very serious problem. I think the remarkable thing is not that they've had a few strikes, but that they've had so few uh, because many people are affected by this. So how do they survive? And I think the answer is most of them have second, third, fourth jobs. In fact, one of the reasons the economic statistics look so bad, they indicate that production is down by 50% as compared with 1990, for example. Uh, I think that uh, these statistics are, are not, not really that accurate. Certainly production is down. But the fact is that when people moonlight or when they take other jobs, they don't want to pay taxes on it. So a lot of that production just doesn't get captured in the statistics. And uh, if you look at electricity production, it's not down nearly as much as GNP is supposedly down, or industrial production is down. Now that normally electricity consumption runs pretty much along with industrial production. So it tells me and many others that it's not really down by 50%, uh, and uh, that indeed a lot of people are surviving on this by working on the side, by finding various ways to do it. Mr. Ambassador, we're, we're certainly grateful to you for a splendid evening.